You're listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby, Director of Torch, the Torah Outreach Resource Center of Houston. This is the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. All right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Jewish Inspiration Podcast, where we meet every week to hopefully get some inspiration, some elevation, some growth in our connection to Hashem. Recently, we've been talking a lot about the special, special trait of bitachon. Bitachon means trust. What is trust? We're just going to do a quick review. Bitachon means that we are trusting in Hashem, but we can only do that if we believe in Hashem. Now, what is belief in Hashem? Emunah. Emunah means not belief, not faith. But it means knowledge. V'yadata hayom v'ashevot alivavecha. You have to have knowledge. You have to have v'yeda kol pa'ul ki atafialto. Every person has to have knowledge of Hashem. It's not enough to just yeah have a leap of faith. No, 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 no. It doesn't. It doesn't. I believe. I believe means yeah. I believe, but it doesn't mean I have knowledge is solid. It's firm. So the first thing when we try to get to bitachon means we have to have first a firm knowledge of Hashem, that Hashem is our creator, that Hashem sustains us, that Hashem, Hashem takes care of us, that Hashem put us in a perfect world, giving us all the tools we need to succeed. What is bitachon? Bitachon is putting our reliance and trust in that creator. Our reliance and our trust in our creator. I want to share with you a cute story. There was a man who came to the Chafetz Chaim and he says, what do I do? My donkey that my whole livelihood came from had died. My donkey died. What do I do? The Chafetz Chaim said, if you indeed believe that your livelihood came from the donkey, indeed you should cry. But your livelihood really comes from the Almighty. And if you're alive, if you understand that your livelihood comes from the Almighty, you have nothing to fear. You have nothing to worry about. A similar story. Someone once came to the Hasidic master and he says to him, Rebbe, Rebbe, what do I do? I need a job. I need Parnassa. I need a livelihood. So the rabbi said, a job? I can give you a blessing for a job. But what does the job have to do with livelihood? Just explain to me. If people think, oh, one plus one equals two. No, not in Hashem's world. In Hashem's world, it equals whatever Hashem wants it to be. How many times have we seen situations where people put efforts in one area and the success comes from a totally different area? One plus one does not equal two. One plus one means I put my effort forward and the other one is that Hashem will provide whatever He decides is the right thing for me. Now, one of the challenges tell you just a beautiful idea, okay? Because in a couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about Yosef, one of my favorite characters in the Torah. Every time I I, I, I learn the, the portions dealing with Yosef, I get emotional. I, I love Yosef is, as a character, as a leader, as a believer in Hashem, someone who never gave up, no matter what the challenge was. Yet, we know he was punished. For two years, he sat in prison because he said two words. He said two words after he, he revealed the dreams to the baker and to the, and to the butler. When the individual goes back to the Pharaoh, he says two words. Remember me for each one of those two words at the level that Yosef was at was unacceptable. He sat in prison for two more years for that. But there's something very interesting that when, when the brothers come and the brothers ask for food, it says a very interesting terminology. It says that Yosef gave them lefi hataf. Lechem lefi hataf. He gave them bread according to the children. Now, simple translation would mean he gave them according to how many people there were. Tell me how many people, that's how much food I will send you. Our sages tell us that Yosef sent food according to the number of children the mouths each had, meaning how many children they had. Or you can read it, trust Hashem like a child trusts his parent, that parents will provide for them. Lechem, you will have for you, for yourselves, lefiataf, like 
you deserve as a child who trusts in his parent. A child knows, a child doesn't worry, where's my next meal coming from? They know their parents are there to take care of them. The children worry, did you get a paycheck this week? Did you get it? Is everything okay? Children are not worried. You know why? Because they know their parents are there to take care of them. And if, if parents are struggling, they'll do everything in the world that their children shouldn't know that they're start struggling. Why? Because the parents care for their children. That's, that's the nature of a parent is to be concerned, to be worried, to be as, 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 you know, diligent as possible to fulfill the needs of our children. And what is Hashem to us? Hashem is that father and mother, that parent who's caring for our every need. It's a big question people ask. Well, then in that case, if Hashem takes care of everything, why do I need to pray? It's a great question. You need to pray because you need to communicate. God wants a relationship with us. He doesn't need our prayers, but he wants our prayers. He loves our prayers. When we talk and we communicate to Hashem, Hashem says, ah, they got the message. I took away their job. I took away their whatever it was so that they talk to me. I want to have a, com- a conversation. Let's communicate. That's the goal. The goal of our communication with God is to build a closer relationship to Hashem. There are a bunch of very important details that we discussed till now. We've discussed previously that there are two different components to bitachon. There's the before the fact, and then there's the after the fact. Before the fact, what do we believe? If you remember, right? we said before the fact, confidence that Hashem will fulfill our needs and help us in any way we need. This is the optimistic attitude we maintain as long as the outcome is not yet determined. Then we have the after the fact. The after the fact perspective is once the outcome is determined, God does whatever is best for us. Whatever is best for us is what he did. And there's no questions. And we have an unshakable trust in Hashem after we come face to face with trials and tribulations. We're ready to accept. We accept exactly that this is what God decided. Okay. We got into a little bit of a conversation last week about what do we do with what's known as hishtadlus, effort. Well, you expect God to just bring it to you, to your house, your livelihood? Well, it really depends. It really depends at what level a person is a believer. The more a person believes, the more a person is connected with Hashem, that they know that every single drop of their livelihood will be taken care of by Hashem, the less effort they need to put forward. Okay, you got that? It's clear. It's a sliding scale. If you have 100% reliance on Hashem, you need zero effort. Now, many people say, well, 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 Rabbi, (laughs) you need to create a vessel so that God can pour that blessing into you need to create that vessel and that's what you do by going to work you're just creating a vessel our sages tell us that even a vessel you don't need to create if you have 100 percent trust in hashem now if you have 10 percent uh a 10 percent trust then you need 90 percent effort if you if you have 50 percent trust you'll need 50 percent effort if you have 90% trust, you only need 10% effort. 99, 1. You understand? Know, it's a sliding scale. And based on that, based on the amount of trust and reliance you have with Hashem, that's how much effort you need to put forward. It's very, very clear. But you you remember what we discussed last week? What did we say? The manna in the desert. What happened? The people who had the highest level of trust, the 100% trust, didn't even need to leave their homes. The manna came to their house. It was right there. Yeah, they had to get out of the chair, perhaps, to get it from the front door. But not more than that. The people who had a in-between level, they had to go out 
and get it. And the people who had no bitachon had to go all the way outside the camp. They had to go all the way outside and pick it up there. But the mana was free. Uh, what was wrong with these people? What was wrong? The mana is free. You're sitting in the desert. You have no way to sustain yourself. There's no vegetation. There's no agriculture. There's nothing. It's a desert. Don't you realize? Don't you realize that God is in control of everything and he's got you covered? Don't you see that every day? There's a mana descending. People have a very hard time letting go. And like we mentioned last week, the more humility you have, the more ability you have to allow yourself to trust. The more arrogance you have, the less you're willing to let go and let God. So this week, this week we're going to discuss the three different aspects of Hishtadlos, the three different types. The person who had 100% trust in Hashem, the person who had Ah, uh, I, I believe everything comes from Hashem, but still you gotta put in an effort, right? That, that kind. And then you have the person who's like, no, whatever you don't kill, you don't, you don't keep. You don't, you don't, uh, go out and earn a living. You don't make a deal. You're not gonna bring home a livelihood. Okay, so let me, let me just clarify. There's nothing wrong with going to work. There's nothing w- wrong with getting a job and having a career. That's not what we're talking about. We're not saying quit your job. What we're saying is have 100% clarity that your job is not what brings you a livelihood. Your job is not what sustains you, but rather it's Hashem who sustains you. And as long as a person has that clarity, as long as a person knows that there is nothing, nothing that he can do with his own hands that can bring him success without Hashem wanting it. So yeah, it's very important to have a good job and a meaningful job, one that brings you satisfaction. And perhaps you can even say, why did Hashem give you that job? So that you be happy and you feel accomplished. And and you enjoy your day. And you wake up with with an excitement to go do the work that you do. Yeah, doctors and nurses and people who do it. You know what? It's an exciting, it's a thrill. I'm I'm waking up to go help people. Even lawyers can be happy in their job, I think, right? Some are, right? (laughs) I'll tell you what. I think I have the greatest job in the world, and that is teaching Hashem's Torah. And I I love it. I love the the privilege, the opportunity every single day that I get a chance and an opportunity. Literally, a privilege to teach Hashem's Torah. So thank you for all make, making it possible. You're not getting the better end. I'm getting the better end of the deal, I'm telling you. Thank you. I appreciate it, though. It, it, it multiplies. Okay, beautiful. We're on page 58, my dear friends. 58, we'll read it out loud. The three systems of Hishtadlut. Hishtadlut, again, means effort. We're going to use that word a lot. Hishtadlut means effort. We shall now examine each of the three general categories or systems of hishtadlut, of effort, as brought forth in the Torah and the elaborations of our sages, among whom we encounter proponents of each type. System number one, no hishtadlus, no effort whatsoever. This is the, the level of those who believe that Hashem will provide for them with no effort on their behalf in making a living. This certainly does not mean that they are idle or use their time in mundane pursuits. This means that they fulfill the commandment of the Torah shall not depart from your mouth and you shall occupy yourself with it day and night. To learn Hashem's Torah day and night. I want to share with you my rabbi, may he live and be well, one of my earlier rabbis, Rabbi Shlomo Arieli, I, I asked him once, I said, I don't understand. How do you support yourself? How do you support yourself? I mean, he teaches in a yeshiva. He has 10 children, 11 children, and he has children to marry off. He has doing, making weddings. I asked him, I said, Rebbe, I don't understand. How do you, how do you maintain your life? How do you maintain your family? How do you? So he says to me, go get me from the shelf. Go get me a Rambam, Maimonides on the laws of Shemitah, 
the laws of the sabbatical. The end of the laws of sabbatical, the Rambam writes that there's a promise we know in the Torah that we just learn about when we talk about Shemitah, about the sabbatical, that anybody who rests their field in the land of Israel for the seventh year is blessed with incredible bounty in the sixth year that will provide for the sixth, seventh, and eighth years. And it's an incredible blessing, an incredible promise. Right now, this moment, we are in middle of the Shemitah year. And if you go to the land of Israel, you will find many, many fields. You'll find many, many fields that say on it, Hefker, it's free. Anybody you want to go take watermelons and cucumbers and, and, and carrots, whatever you find in the fields, you're welcome to take in those fields because Hashem says, let your field go. Well, what's the whole idea? The whole idea is recognize that everything is from Hashem. And Hashem is the one who sustains you. And you think your field grows for you during the other six years because of your doing? No, it's a reminder that everything is from Hashem. And if you're ready to let go, the blessing will be incredible. So the Rambam writes over there. He says, so what about those who are studying Torah and they don't have fields? He says, if you let go of every worldly pursuit to study Torah, you are guaranteed incredible bounty. You are guaranteed that every single thing that you need, vidor she Hashem lo kol tov. Those who seek Hashem will not lack anything. You will not lack anything. And my rabbi said, when I saw this Rambam, I gave up everything. And all I do every day, all day, is sit and learn Torah. He says, and I've never worried a day since. You're not worried? You're not concerned? How are you going to pay your bills? You have an electric bill? You have this, a wedding to pay? Nothing. Hashem is the one who provides. And if a person really understands with all their heart, with all of their, with every fiber of their being, that everything is in the hand of Hashem, they have nothing to fear. They have nothing to worry about. So, that's the highest level, the highest level of a person's uh, trust in Hashem is where they need zero hishtadlut, zero effort. Those on this level maintain that Hashem calls them His children, and Hashem is the loving Father in in heaven. So if He commands that they immerse themselves in Torah day and night, then he will provide all their needs, right? Hashem commands us to learn Torah day and night. How in the world does he expect us to earn a livelihood? God says, I got you covered. You go do your job, learn Torah day and night, and I'll take care of you. This is an explicit promise. Also in the Torah, if you diligently heed my commandments, you will gather your grain, your wine, and your oil. How? Ah, Hashem will provide it for you. The inherent factor of this level is one's dedicated commitment to round-the-clock Torah study, uninterrupted by anything other than prescribed daily prayers and basic fulfillment of the bodily functions that are necessary in keeping the body healthy, such as eating, drinking, and sleeping, and even these, at a minimum, no frill level with no indulgence at all. Okay, so what are we talking about here? We're talking about a complete commitment and dedication to Torah study without any add-ons. No games. No monkey business. Torah, Torah, Torah. This is your commitment. Hashem says, I got you covered. Jeremiah the prophet was the prime proponent of the system. Jeremiah chastises the populace for chasing after income and neglecting Torah while raising up a jar of manna that had been preserved in the holy temple and declaring, your forefathers in the desert occupied themselves with Torah. Look at what sustained them. The manna right here. There was a portion of manna that was inside the holy ark. And that's the manna that that Jeremiah held up. The manna, the heaven sent bread. You as well. Look at the sustained manna. Occupy yourselves in Torah. And the Almighty will send your income the same way. Anybody who doesn't see that their income comes exactly like the mana came, 
is not looking. Okay, the Gemara mentions this system and its proponent, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. He says, is it acceptable that people should toil in their fields? What will be with the Torah? When will a person devote himself to fulfilling the will of Hashem and learning Torah? Then you know what happens when someone does that. Others do the work for him. This is the system the Vilna Gon and the altar of Novartic, the great holy sages, lived 100, 200 years ago. That's the way they lived their lives. How are we going to live? Who's going to sustain us? Where are we going to get bread from? How are we going to pay our mortgage? Who's going to make the car payments? System number one, 100% reliance on Hashem and have nothing to fear, have nothing to worry about, have nothing to question. System number two, minimal hishtadlos. Minimal hishtadlos, minimal effort. This is the system that most of our sages hold by. The Gemara mentions that Rabbi Yishmael disagrees with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and maintains that a person must do some form of minimal hishtadlos, minimum effort in making a living and then devote the rest of his time to Torah. Rabbi Gamliel, the son of Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, would say, beautiful is the study of Torah with worldly endeavors. Torah im derech eretz, with worldly endeavors. For the toil retards sin. Keeps you away, right? So a person who's busy learning Torah and keeping himself busy with a livelihood. Ultimately, all Torah study that is not accompanied with work is destined to become null and void and to cause sin. Oh, well, that's probably if someone is not able to learn Torah all day and be committed fully to a full occupation of Torah, so they'll have time that they're just sitting around. When someone sits around, what happens? They do silly things, and they can resort to sin. King David, who in his younger years combined herding sheep with his most devoted service of Hashem, he says, when you eat the fruits of your labor, you shall be happy and all will be well good for you. This is by no means a license to do more than the absolute minimum. For King David also says, how I love you, Torah. It is on my lips the entire day. So King David, even though he believed you have to make a minimal effort, a minimal heshtadlos, still his whole day was occupied with Torah. According to Rabbeinu Bachia, and there's some many, many opinions on this, any hishtadlos that is in excess of the bare minimum is a flaw in bitachon. So you do, you show up, you do what you need to do, and you go home, and you continue learning, and you're not worried about how it's going to, you know, what, how are you going to make ends meet? The Holy al Sheikh and Reb Chaim Voloshin say that while the system of no hishtadlos is very, very lofty, it is only workable for a small select few. Therefore, the broad populace should at least strive for this level of bitachon, where they devote more time to learning Torah while doing minimal hishtadlos. The Ramchal is also a proponent of the system. So you see, many, many of the sages are really not pushing for the absolute, like my rabbi, 100% bitachon and zero, zero effort but rather a balanced approach. Now, what's an imbalanced approach? An imbalanced approach is the last approach, and that is when someone doesn't have proper trust in Hashem, and they need to put full effort forward. And this is system number three. This system maintains that since we exist in a physical world, we must make whatever effort that is needed according to nature and not rely on miracles. According to this opinion, it's all a miracle, and therefore you can't, you're not, the Talmud tells us, you can't rely on miracles, and therefore everything is in the effort. Yet, there are two types of people who engage in full effort, full hishtadlut. Working all day long, and even overtime. The first group are the believers, who 
the one who trusts in Hashem but work because of the primeval curse by the sweat of your brow you shall eat bread yet they put their trust in Hashem once they do their best effort as King Salman indicates when he says the horse is prepared for battle but victory is Hashem's so this is a, a, a little bit of a different approach, and that is that we put forward our full effort, 100% effort, but we still have a belief that everything comes from Hashem, okay? King Solomon is teaching us that a soldier must do everything he can to be victorious. His personal weapon should be spotless clean and well lubricated so that it doesn't jam in battle. The tank should be impeccably maintained and equipped. The soldier must maintain top physical condition. Once all that has been done, he goes to battle while casting his heart and hopes to Hashem for victory and salvation. By the same token, the merchant must be sure that his store is clean, well-stocked, and appealing to customers. Once that has been done, he prays to Hashem for success. So yes, this is a different case where a person, yeah, you got to put forward your effort and do everything you got to do to make a sale, but recognize that it's only from Hashem. And if Hashem decides that you'll be successful, you'll be successful. But you have to put forward your effort. The second group of people who engage in full hishtadlus, in full effort, are the non-believers. The ones who believe that their income depends on them only and has nothing to do with Hashem. Heaven forbid. These are the people with no emuna, much less bitachon, who work from sun up to sundown. Although both groups engage in full hishtadlus, in full effort, this is a huge difference. There is a huge difference between them. The believers adhere to the laws of Torah and would not touch a cent that doesn't belong to them in their quest for income. They will also give their tithe to charity and oftentimes more depending on their individual level of bitachon. They also pray and look to Hashem for help. The non-believers, however, often ignore the laws of Torah in fighting for their daily dollar. For them, income is a war and in their minds, there is no set rules in war. Such people are liable to shortchange workers, customers, and suppliers. They might not adhere to their promises. Frequently, they speak harmfully about colleagues and competitors. They'll run to the ends of the earth to search for income. And they'll also spend time and money, often excessively, in seeking professionals and others who might, who they think might help them solve a problem rather than turning to Hashem. These are also the ones who talk about business on Shabbos, even in the synagogues during the Torah reading, apparently not believing that Hashem sees what they do, hears what they say, or knows all their thoughts. So this second category of full effort people uh, is not a great clan of, of, uh, of people. We may have heard of people, you wonder, like how is that possible that someone can can cheat Someone can be dishonest because sadly people don't realize that every single thing that you're meant to get, you will get. And what you're not meant to get, even if you steal it, it's not going to help you. It's not going to help you. And you'll have to lose it some other way. And we think, oh, it's a, it's a, what a terrible misfortune. They, they have a, a leaky pipe, right? Why, why do you have that leaky pipe? Well, perhaps there was some money that was, not honestly attained. Hashem is taking that away from you now. There are many things that come when a person doesn't live at the level that they could or that they should. When a person doesn't live at the level where they have a munah, where they know that everything comes from Hashem and exactly what is destined to me, I will receive and what is not destined to me, I will not receive. Then there's nothing to be concerned about. There's nothing to be concerned about. You know, there's a great story 
there was a, I think I mentioned this someplace along this, uh, this series. You may have heard the story, so I apologize if I'm repeating the story, but there was a, a, a baker in the, in the, in the city of Jerusalem who had one of his main managers who was managing his floor decided it was a good idea to open up a competing store right across the street, a competing bakery. So what would all of us would have done? What, what, what would we have done? We probably would not be so comfortable with our competitor opening up. Oh, yeah, this guy, where, I trained him. I taught him. He has all my recipes, everything. Opens up right across. What a chutzpah. But that's not the way the storekeeper, the, 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 the baker saw it. And he went over to him. And this is a guy who worked for him for several years. And he says, I want to just tell you where you can get the flour where you can get the high quality and where you can get it for cheaper. And he's helping him out. And the family is wondering, like, what's wrong with you? Why are you helping your competitor? Why are you helping him? What was his answer? His answer was, you think livelihood comes from my good cookies? You think it comes from my pastries? You think it comes from my chalas? You think it comes from my work? It comes from Hashem. Plus... Everything has been predestined from Rosh Hashanah. So who am I? Who am I to, to not be willing to assist a neighbor who needs help? I'm not going to lose anything from it. It was predestined already. I'm going to get exactly what I was predestined to get from Rosh Hashanah. I have nothing to be concerned about. Imagine if we all thought like that. Imagine if we dealt with our competitors, quote unquote. There's no competitors. It's how much do you believe in Hashem? We have no competitors. Like you're in the furniture industry, right? You don't have any competitors. You really don't. And when you see someone struggling, opening up, a, you know, they have a furniture store, go help them out. You know why? Because everything that, every single dollar that you were supposed to get, you're going to get. And when you show the trust that you have in Hashem, that you're ready, ready to help everybody out and you have no fear, no concern that it's going to affect your livelihood because you know Hashem will take care of you. Hashem says, wow, that's exemplary. That's a remarkable act of selflessness. With the above in mind, even a person who engages in full hishtadlus, in full effort, must strengthen his or her bitachon to reassure that they observe to assure that they observe the laws of the Torah while doing what they must to make a living. Means, you know, my father once uh, said a story. He when he when he was he told us a story when he was um he hired someone to work for him for a little for like I think it was like the first or second day. And my father did like a recap look. So what happened today? And he tells him what he did. He says, "What do you mean? Whoa, 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 whoa! What what do you mean? You said that? That's not true." He says, what do you mean not true? It's business. You can say whatever you want. And that was his last day. That was his last day working with that. Right? Got out. You can't be dishonest. Well, people think that, oh, for business, to earn a livelihood. That's, that's, that's the goal. That's the mission. That's the objective. No. We're not brought in this world to earn a living. That's not why God brought us here. We're not brought to this world to have a career. We're brought to this world for what purpose? To serve Hashem. Hashem will give us everything we need to serve Him. Now, okay, we need to keep ourselves busy. We can't sit and learn Torah all day. Okay, great. Hashem says, go get a job that'll be fulfilling. Get a job that you'll enjoy. Get a job that you'll be able to meet people. But to utilize it as an opportunity. To become a better person. This is the bare minimum that is demanded from us, from all of us, Jews and non-Jews alike. So we all understand. And you know, if you talk to any normal, level-headed person, they'll tell you that um, they don't think that it's it's a good idea to cheat. Right? Most people will tell you, yeah, cheating is no good. So why do people still do it? Why do we have, Shem should forgive him. But why do we have a Bernie Madoff? But where did it start from? 
It didn't start from greed. It started from rounding off. Well, it's a little bit, or just a little something. Yeah, it's an arrogance. Everything is me. If I don't, if I don't make it, if I'm not going to cheat, I'm not going to earn a living. I have to cheat. It's not. That's not a good way to live life. It's tragic. It's tragic for the, for 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 him as an individual. It's tragic for his family, but it's also tragic for all the people. Right, all the people that, that that are hurt from this, and that's us, the Jewish people. We're supposed to be a light unto the nations. The people, the people of the nations of the world, look up to us to be an example. And when we waste an example, when we waste an opportunity to be a good example, then the nations of the world say, "What rights do you have to claim that you're the chosen people?" Why do you deserve the land of Israel? And like we studied in the Talmud a few weeks ago, yeah, when the Torah descended at Mount Sinai, hatred descended at Mount Sinai. Meaning, the nations of the world had the power to inflict pain on the Jews if we did not observe the Torah. If we don't connect to Hashem, if we don't take our commitments, if we don't take our relationship with Hashem to the next level, the nations of the world have free reign to slap us upside the head and say, get back on track. That's your job. I had, I mentioned this story in the past. I was in, yeah, I, I get this many times. I don't, I don't go that frequently anymore to grocery shopping. Uh, because today they have all these delivery and it saves you a tremendous amount of time. Uh, so it's worth the money. But, uh, the, so, but when I, I was, I used to go every week right after class. I used to go on Wednesday night. I would go already buy the food for Shabbos and people would stop me. Oh, what's that? I had this today, by the way, when I went to pick up, I walked out of my car to pick up curbside pickup. And as I walk out, the guy's like, what's that on your head? What do you call that? I'm like, it's called a kippa. And I, I always like to explain to them. And they're like, okay, I wasn't sure what it was called. I'm like, do you know why it's called a, a yarmulke? It's called a yarmulke. Why is it called a yarmulke? Because it's two words, yare malka, fear of heaven. It's supposed to remind us that we, we're supposed to be humble before God. Have fear of God. That's the way we're supposed to carry ourselves. So this individual stopped me once and you know, people always say, oh, what is that? That's tzitzit. What's that? The yarmulke. I get this. I get that question all the time. Where we are, we're, we're a billboard. We're a billboard of, of what hopefully what uh, God-fearing Jews are supposed to look like, hopefully. So one guy stopped me and he says, would you mind if I touch your tzitzit? That's the fringes on a four-corner garment, right? There's a mitzvah in the Torah that every four-corner garment that you wear should have tzitzit on it, and I have mine right here. You can see. Oh, you can't see it on the camera. But either way, uh, trust me, it's here. People in the audience, right? Okay, you see it. Okay, great. So he says to me, can I touch your tzitzit? I said, go right ahead. So you can touch my tzitzit. He stops and he says, do you realize your responsibility? He says, do you realize that we, the nations of the world, we look up to the Jews to be an example? You have a responsibility. To be an example. We look up to you. You receive the Torah. You're God's chosen people. You need to be an example for us. And it hit me. You don't realize that when you grow up. Oh, I'm just, uh, yeah. yeah, you're a Catholic and I'm a Jew. <laughs> you know, you're, you're a uh, Muslim and I'm a Jew. No, that's not the way it is. We are handpicked by the Almighty, Asher Bach, Arbanu, Mikolo Amim. God chose us from all the nations to be an example. It's a responsibility that we have, not to be taken lightly. In what way am I demonstrating my Judaism properly in front of the world? The world is looking at us. In what way am I doing that properly? And that's what we need to recognize every single day. This is our responsibility. And it's a big responsibility. It's a heavy responsibility, but a joyful one. We have to realize that we are Asher Baruch 
the one that God chose. If God, if God chose us, wow, it's awesome. You know, it's like the relationship that we have with God is supposed to be a relationship of love, but also a relationship of fear. How can you have both? How can you have both love and fear? It's very simple because you have to have love because love is recognizing how precious this relationship is. What is fear? Fear is I, I don't want to mess things up. I don't want to do something that I, that I wasn't supposed to do. It's fear of missing out on this relationship. It's so precious. Most people who are in a committed relationship, in a loving relationship, don't live every day with fear, ter- trepidation. But there's a certain level of fear. What's the level of fear? You don't want to do something that will hurt your relationship. That doesn't mean you're shaking under a table, worried. It just means it keeps you on a, on a, on a path to do the right thing and stay away from trouble because if you do something which is wrong, it can, it can harm your relationship. So you have that, that balance of love and fear. Our relationship with God is the same. When we talk about bitachon, of having trust in Hashem, it's recognizing that Hashem is our Father in Heaven who's there to take care of us. Take care of us every single moment of the day. Hashem is there to take care of us. You know what? And it's like someone once said, well, I have, I have trust in Hashem that He will heal uh, a family member and, 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 and bring them to a full recovery. That's not the correct attitude. We don't have trust in an outcome. We have a trust that Hashem is there and will do the best for us. He is capable of doing anything He wants, but He will choose to do that which is proper for us. The fact is that Hashem gives every single person a unique set of circumstances. There are no two people on planet Earth, even you and your sister or brother, grew up in totally different worlds. Worlds. I know me and my siblings, different existence completely. Well, what do you mean? You grew up in the same home. Right. Different years, different friends, different talents, different abilities, different flaws, different challenges, and even different parents. Meaning we had the same biological parents, but they were at a different stage of their life. There are different, more experienced parents, less experienced parents. My parents were always amazing from beginning to end. They still are amazing. Every single day they should live and be well. There's 120. But you know what? We grew up in different homes. We grew up as different individuals. And this is the most, by, by the way, when we talk about parenting, this is the number one key, is that every child is an individual. Every child is unique. So yeah, everyone is given special tools. Everyone is given a different set of equipment. One person has a great people skills and one person has great uh, book book skills and one person is better academically and one person is better socially and one person is an extrovert and one is an introvert and one is very, very bright and one is very challenged and one is... Everybody's got their basket of fruit. Everybody's got their, their things. Everybody's got it. And why does Hashem do it? Because Hashem gives every single person a different job. The Talmud said, what would happen if everybody was interested in the same career? Everybody was a plumber. You wouldn't have an electrician, right? You wouldn't have a teacher. You wouldn't have a, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have a doctor. You wouldn't have anything, right? But yet Hashem miraculously makes the world in a way that everybody finds their own occupation that's fulfilling for them, that's enjoyable for them. You ask, her, hey, do you want to be a dentist? You want to, you, no, no, thank you. I don't want to be, any, right? But dentists can't imagine anybody doing anything other than that. They think it's the greatest job on earth, right? Hashem wired every single person uniquely different. And that's the gift. My dear friends, let's hopefully be among those who are on the upper levels of bitachon, who are on the higher levels, who are able to really let go, realize that everything that we have, every Job that we have, guess what? The job is just a job. It's an opportunity for us to let go and to recognize that Hashem is in control. And the minute we have that feeling 
and we reaffirm it. And it's it's not going to be an easy labor. It's going to be a, a, a consistent, we're going to have to reaffirm this within ourselves. It is the most freeing, the most empowering relationship with Hashem we will ever experience. I, I feel Hashem. I know He's there right there with me. He's taking care of every single one of my needs. There's nothing that Hashem cannot do. He's got it all covered. He's going to take care of me. I know it. And the more we're able to take it in, internalize it more and more, the less worry we have. The less concern we have. Hashem li lo ira. When I know that Hashem is with me, I have nothing to fear. And the more we're able to instill this in ourselves, the happier, more carefree, and the most anxiety-free people in the world. That's what we're looking to be because we're confident in our relationship with Hashem. So let's go get Him. Go go do your job. Go earn a living. But remember that everything is from Hashem. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a terrific evening. You've been listening to the Jewish Inspiration Podcast, a Torch production. Become a supporter at torchweb.org because your assistance enables more Torah learning around the globe. To find more lessons offered by Torch, please visit torchpodcasts.com.